Hey Gerard, when are you gonna recomplete Donkey Kong 64? Ah, I can't wait till you recomplete Donkey Kong 64. It's my DK64 favorite is an game. overrated collectathon. Gerard, what do you you get should for recomplete all it. And I see love if you still like it. It's a unique character. Beaver ball. Definitely all worth a recomplete. Dance Shep, you're gonna revisit Donkey Kong 64. Recomplete Donkey Kong 64. Okay. Recomplete Donkey Kong 64. Recomplete Donkey Kong 64. Okay. Dig this, gamer crew. I'm a big guy with a big heart. I've kicked my share of ass, but not without a good friend at my back. I love to rock out, bang on drums, I've got a lot of hair, and I'm a disappointment to my elders. I have a cool brother with a business sense, and I'm pretty sure I own a red tie. And I collect things. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Completionist New Game Plus, where I am recompleting the first 120 games I ever featured here on the channel. For all aspects of myself that I just mentioned, I identify myself with the big man, Donkey Kong, more than any other video game character out there. He has been the gorilla embodiment of me since childhood. So when they turned him into a 3D force of destruction, I turned into the most excited kid in the neighborhood. I mastered Donkey Kong 64. No joke, I was the DK64 guru all the other kids came to during recess. Every boss, I advised them how to defeat him. Every banana, I told them how to get him. Friends wouldn't let me leave their houses until I beat that one annoying challenge for them even though their parents were getting a divorce, dude. Let me go home. I'm ready to go home. Anyways, there was a local toy store that was doing a Donkey Kong 64 competition and I showed up and I won in spades. You know what I got? This guy right here. Recognize it? From the, from the intro? Da -da 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 -da. From the intro you just saw. You've been seeing it for years. Now, come on, man. Well, at the very least, I'm ready to share my expertise and knowledge with you guys today when I recomplete Donkey Kong 64. Okay. So you got a sense of how hyped I was for Donkey Kong 64 way back when it came out. And I know I wasn't alone. Despite needing a huge overhaul after banking on the N64 disk drive and the fact that the N64 was entering its twilight years, Nintendo and Rare proved that the console still had big titles to dish out. But I mean, why wouldn't we be excited? The Donkey Kong Country Trilogy was the main staple of the SNES, and we were lucky enough to get a new game three years in a row. Three years in a console later, just as the thumbsticks on our N64 controllers were losing resiliency, we finally got the news that DK was coming back. Not only was his return overdue, but he was coming back for the first time in 3D. We all knew it was gonna happen eventually, and it finally happened. Mario got his 3D treatment, and people were like, man, this is the best Mario game ever. Link got his 3D treatment, and people were like, man, this is the best Zelda game ever. By 1999, we were entitled to this new 3D Donkey Kong game. Furthermore, the news that the game was so big and beautiful that it needed an expansion pack to run properly, and that it was bundled with the game at no extra cost, merely added to the excitement, and it was cool to already have it by the time Majora's Mask rolled around. But that's beside the point. The point is that it was exciting to see our ape friend in his own 3D game. And that excitement I felt as a kid is what made me want to complete it in the early years of The Completionist. So what sort of villainy is King K. Rule up to this time around? King K. Rule starts by accidentally crashing his giant floating mechanical island into the home of the Kongs, DK Isle. This damages his blastomatic destruction ray and delays his plan to level the Kong's home. King K. Rool's Kremlin army fervently begin repairs, but in the meantime, they kidnap four of DK's friends, Tiny, Lanky, Chunky, and our good old pal Diddy. To add insult to injury, they've also stolen DK's horde of golden bananas and scattered them across the aisle. Donkey Kong must free his friends one by one in order to team up, retrieve the stolen bananas, and send King K. Rule and his army a packing. Now, DK64 draws numerous influences from its predecessors, and not only its predecessors, but other rare titles like Banjo Kazooie, for instance. But being on a whole new console, DK64 plays much differently than the original games. It is a 3D platformer through and through, borrowing much of its controls from the pretty much perfect Mario 64. You know, A is jump, ZA is higher, backflip jump, run ZA is long jump, that sort of thing. 
However, this game went a step further by giving each Kong unique abilities and weapons, all of which need to be utilized in order to solve puzzles, defeat enemies, and progress. And I'll point out that this game relies heavily on backtracking as much is inaccessible until you free the proper Kong or obtained or upgraded the necessary ability or weapon. Between the buildup of the game's release and the pride I felt as a DK64 guru back in the day, Donkey Kong 64 is and probably always be one of my favorite 3D platformers. However, when I first completed it for the show, I found myself less patient for all of its repetitive qualities. That led me to give the game a ranking of finna peed it, as we were still in the days of half ratings. And now I've done away with those, I'm guaranteed to change my stance here. So it's safe to say that this game's either going to get a finish it or a complete it. A finish it or a complete it is on the horizon. Okay. Replay. Let's just knock this out real quick, okay? Time will pass, opinions will change, but the DK games will always be full of charm. Not only does Donkey Kong 64 uphold this sentiment, but its characters are absolutely overflowing with personality. Don't believe me? Turn the game on, just simply turn it on. Okay. Tell me that voice doesn't exude really, really, really cool dude vibes. I immediately know the vibe I'm gonna get from this game when all I've heard is one word and seen the logo. All right, so still not sold? Just wait a few seconds and you'll witness one of the greatest things in video game history, the DK rap. Now this DK rap is very divisive amongst everyone in the world. They either hate it or they love it or they're in for the cheese of it. And I am legitimately on the love it side. My man Grant Kirkhope absolutely nailed this work of art. It encapsulates the whole tone of the game and perfectly conveys each Kong's personality. As a kid, whenever I'd power the game on, I always faced the dilemma of whether or not I was going to skip it, and I often held off. It got me excited to play as each character, and I was kind of bummed the first time that I played the game and realized I couldn't mess around with all of the characters immediately. I now consider singing along to the DK rap completion criteria, so you bet I did that for my original playthrough, and I'm doing it once again for this playthrough too. I was actually surprised when I heard that this song got a lot of crap back in the day, and over the years for being a subpar rap song. I'd like to respect everyone's opinion, but it's my opinion that that opinion is a bullshit opinion. I mean, was there a movement pushing for this song to win a Grammy that I wasn't aware of? Were people arguing that it was the same level as Dre or Fiddy? I just knew it as a silly song to introduce the characters, and anyone choosing to criticize it as attempting to be anything more is kind of missing the point here. It's merely there to show us the Kong personalities, like Lanky being a doof and Chunky being a big oaf. All in a fun, here we are, run DMC sort of way. D. K. Donkey Kong. D. K. It's tricky, 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 tricky. Okay, so I haven't even touched on how the Kong's personalities exude through the gameplay yet. Before this game, the DK tag barrels were just a way to retrieve your lost partner. But this time, we get a glimpse inside that barrel. Collecting five golden bananas in every level with every Kong, plus all the other collectibles, plus the fact that one Kong is often required to help another Kong gain access to their respective bananas means that the player is constantly jumping to the tag barrel to swap characters. But the tag barrel isn't just a boring static screen. No, the game turned this dark void into an opportunity to let these characters shine. Each one you highlight has a unique animation that says, choosing me is the right choice, my dude. It's always satisfying when I highlight DK and he gives me this, yeah, cool. By highlighting Chunky, you see an exception to the eagerness that all the others share. Then there's the plethora of unique abilities that are tailor-made for each character. Tiny Kong is cool and stylish, and her hair twirling ability allows her to reach areas others can't while also paying homage to her older sister Dixie from the previous games. Diddy's chimp charge is right on track for him as he is literally running headfirst into things to solve problems. This is done with no regard to his personal well-being, proven by the exasperated grunt that follows. And Lanky's ability to inflate like a balloon and float to higher ground shows off the carefree attitude of the most cartoonish guy in the bunch. Now, guns were an unexpected addition to a Donkey Kong game, but what made them work was that they were less as weapons and more as a means of activating switches. Funky Kong returns as a shop owner in this game and provides each character with a weapon that reflects their attributes. Chunky's pineapple launcher is powerful yet slow. Tiny's feather crossbow is weak yet fast. You get the point. 
It also cracks me up how jazzed each Kong is to bust out their firearm, with me feeling slightly more uncomfortable about it in my current playthrough. If, if at this point you're digging the personalities of each character, their musical instruments will make you love them even more. Like Funky, Candy Kong appears in each level and gives the characters an instrument that they can rock out with to defeat certain enemies around them, open doors, or just do a bunch of other random things. You can do anything with the power of Sweet Sweet Jams. Not only are the instruments necessary to progress, but they once again give life to each character. DK bangs in his bongos and gets so carried away that he ends up standing on them by the end of his animation. Diddy's brash, and nothing but a loud electric guitar will do. Chunky's triangle reflects his ironic gentleness as he is the most physically intimidating of the crew. Now, I found myself using the instruments way more on this recent playthrough than the previous ones. Unless there's a platform that requires a specific conked instrument in order to activate something, I kind of forgot about them. This time around, I made it a point to use them more effectively. Rocking out was a great way to take out a cluster of bees overhead, and I used them way more on the Kasplat enemies. There's one of these in every level for every Kong, and defeating them will cause them to drop a blueprint. These are then traded to Snide, who gives you a golden banana for each one, making their collection necessary for completion. Kasplats take multiple normal hits to defeat, and are often on pretty small platforms where one wrong move can knock you right off. You can shoot them from a distance, but if you don't get to the blueprint in time, it disappears, forcing you to wait around until the enemy respawns. I found it much more effective to get right in their face, play some sweet jazz, and watch the blueprint fall directly in front of me. It was a time saver and allowed me to enjoy the fun personas much more often. I feel like I barely scratched the surface in regards to how much character was infused into this game. K. Rool was more humorous than we'd ever seen him before, as was the cast of other non-playable characters like Cranky and Funky. Despite lacking that moodiness I loved from the previous games, it masterfully transitioned to match the tone of whatever environment you were in, and that deserves a shout out. At the very least, in my eyes, DK64 has a lot of wonderful things going for it. For every bad thing there is that exists, there's a lot of quality stuff here and collectibles. Lots and lots of collectibles. Collectibles, backtracking, more collectibles, duplicate bonus stages, more backtracking, and more collectibles. The perfect 3D platformer exists within Donkey Kong 64, but it is padded the hell out with repetitive gameplay. Granted, a lot of it can be avoided by simply beating the game, but for all of you completionists like me, expect to get bogged down with some heavy repetition. It's hard to figure out where to begin as most of the completion criteria is intertwined with each other. So let's start with the most basic collectible, regular bananas. There are 500 of these in each of the seven main levels, 100 for each character, yellow for Donkey, red for Diddy, blue for Lanky, purple for Tiny, and green for Chunky. You only need a certain collective amount in order to make a hippo heavier than a pig so that the pig can turn the key to unlock the door to the boss fight, which is weird, but that's a separate conversation altogether that I'm pretty sure your parents should have with you. If a character collects most of their bananas in a level, they get a banana medal. If a character collects all of their bananas in a level, you'll hear a little monkey sound. This doesn't do anything, but since they are there and I didn't want anyone to get mad at me, I made sure to collect all of the bananas in the game. Okay, so let's talk about those banana medals. Collecting 15 allows you to play Cranky's Retro Jetpack games. There are way more than 15 throughout the game though, and you'll need all of them to get to that 101% completion. But since you get the medals by collecting most of the regular bananas, and I've already decided to collect all the regular bananas, we're gonna get all the banana medals anyways. And between all the characters, there are nearly a thousand banana coins, which are used to buy abilities, weapons, and instruments. Only a tiny fraction are needed to progress, but I got them all. And of course, then there's the five golden bananas for each character in every level, plus the overworld itself. We've also got the banana fairies scattered throughout the game that need to be photographed in order to get the bonus golden banana. And a part of those five golden bananas for every character, one of their golden bananas is tied to the Kasplat blueprints I mentioned earlier. And you all see where I'm going with this? There's a reason why this game is negatively labeled as a collectathon, and I can't argue against it. It's a lot, my dudes, and collecting it all gets old. And it's not like you can get everything there is to get in a level and then leave it in your wake. No, so much is inaccessible until you unlock the proper Kong or obtain a necessary ability, causing you to constantly backtrack to previous levels. 
Now, personally, I don't mind a little bit of backtracking here. Obviously, Metroidvania games utilize it the best in how even if you're technically going backwards, you do so in order to open an entirely new area. It's like taking one step backward to go five steps forward. Some of the backtracking in DK64 was okay, but a lot of it felt like taking one step backward and one step forward. A few golden bananas are obtained by beating bonus stage mini games. Some are fun and provide a decent challenge, yet they overall feel like filler compared to the rest of the game. I won't say they don't belong in DK64, but here's the thing. Halfway through the game, they just repeat. These challenges provide mild amusement at best, but I guess the developers felt the need to fill space, so they doubled down on them. So if Beaver Bother gave you trouble, guess what? It's coming back in the game later with two higher difficulties. Fun. Can't wait to get to that again. It's so interesting to discover how, as I get older, I become more patient with some aspects of games and less patient with others. Collectathons and backtracking are definitely geared more towards young Gerard, as I found them far less enjoyable when I first played this game for the show. I probably would have disliked them even more for this current playthrough had it not been for one thing. Modern Gerard is all about exploiting and finding glitches. Yeah, baby, give me those sweet, sweet speed run juice, Papa, because Papa's going through stuff. Okay, so you know those banana fairies you have to get the photographs of? Well, normally you have to pass up any you find early in the game until you unlock Tiny Kong, get her shrink ability, access the banana fairy island, and receive the camera. This, of course, forces you to backtrack to find those early game fairies and snap photos of them, but not anymore. There's a glitch that allows DK to swim into the fairy isle and get the camera at the very beginning of the game. This time, I see a fairy, I snap a fairy. Done deal. Additionally, there's the crystal cave level that isn't meant to be accessed until late late, late in the game. Since you should have nearly all of your weapons and abilities fully upgraded by the time you access this level, visiting Cranky, Candy, or Funky in the Crystal Caves will allow you to receive any of the weapons and upgrades you may have missed up to this point. However, there is a glitch known as the Moon Jump or Moon Kick to some that allows DK to soar straight up into the air and bypass the gigantic boulder blocking the entrance to Crystal Caves. Once inside, there's a second glitch that allows you to bypass the bee locker standing in front of the level's portal door. It's kind of confusing to explain, but it involves positioning and pressing B a certain way that eventually the game just pushes you through the door. Links on how to do that in the boxes down below. Doing so allowed me to go to Crystal Caves way early and unlock substantially almost every major ability for every character once I've unlocked them. It reduced the backtracking significantly and it made the game more fun in my eyes. So I've already started the game with DK and I already have a fairy camera and all of the weapons and upgrades I needed. Now, whenever I unlock a fellow Kong, they can immediately get all the weapons and upgrades. I love Donkey Kong 64, but this is how I play from now on. I'm much happier with the more linear path I had this time around than I had on my last playthrough completing the game in the old fashioned way. Cause even with the glitch exploits, there's still a ton of backtracking and there's still tons of collectibles padding out this game. It's too much stuff. Too much stuff. Too much stuff. Sell the lamp. Gerard, stop. Socks. You, 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 you can stop. Ted's trash. Please, Gerard, it's napkins. Too, it's too much. What? Gerard. No, it's not. No, you've, you're literally just collecting garbage at this point. You're right. I guess all of the good things got covered by all the other things I've been collecting. I'll get the dust buster. Or we, we don't have a dust buster. Review! Okay, so we got the nanners, the nanner coins, the nanner medals, the nanner photos, the nanner fairies, the nanner blueprints. We got the nanner everything, my friends. So let's see what kind of rewards we get here. Starting off with the blueprints that were collected and given to Snide. Now they actually serve two purposes in addition to getting a golden banana in exchange for each one. By giving Snide blueprints, he's able to delay the Blastomatic from firing. Towards the end of the game, it's kind of this end game escape sequence. The more blueprints you give him, the longer you have to dismantle the Blastomatic. 
giving him every single blueprint in the game provides more time than I needed, but it's nice that the game gives you that for your efforts. There is a bigger reward for giving Snide every single blueprint, however. Remember those bonus mini stages I mentioned earlier? Once you beat them, there's no way to play them again. That is, until you turn over all 40 blueprints. Once that's done, you can visit Snide in any of his locations, and he allows you to replay any of those mini games that you want. Thank you for the reward, DK64. I will never be doing that again. Now, as a kid, I loved this so much that I wanted to live in this world for as long as I could. That meant I was ready to jump back into a few mini games and maintain my DK64 guru status. But times change, and now I'm looking to get my nostalgia fix and move on. And need I remind you, these mini games already repeat within the game, so I've already played each one twice. It's a nice gesture, Donkey Kong, but my heart must go on. Now, I went back and forth on whether or not I needed to collect every single regular banana and banana coin in the game, and I decided, yes, I have to go for it. Beyond the 75 bananas each Kong needs in order to get a banana medal in every level, the remaining 25 are superfluous. You get nothing for having them aside from your start menu showing 100 bananas and hearing a little chimp sound when you get the 100th one. Similar story with the banana coins. Between all characters, there are over 900 of them in the game, but you only need a sixth of them to purchase all the abilities, weapons, and upgrades. The rest are just there if you want to get them. You don't even get a chimp sound for these things. Neither the bananas nor the banana coins count toward the 101 progress percentage on your save file. So they're really just there if you want to get them. Again, this is where I split ways from my childhood self. There was a time where I was happy to explore every single inch of this game, switching back and forth between characters to get stuff for no other reason besides the fact that it was there. But I had grown out of enjoying collection for collection's sake of my original episode, and I'm a little more jaded today. Then there's everything else that is required for that 101% on your save file. All of the golden bananas collected, that extra golden banana for photographing all the banana fairies, all those banana medals earned, and battle crowns earned by surviving battle arena stages. The boss keys and the two special coins earned by beating the two retro games within DK64 are technically completion criteria, but they're also required to merely beat the game. You couldn't get the last boss key to fight King K. Rule unless you got those two coins. Honestly, I think the game could have benefited from some slight reconstruction, especially with those two retro games. I mean, I mean, look, they were tough, and my heart went out to all the other kids out there who just wanted to beat Donkey Kong, but were stuck on Donkey Kong. I mean, I was fine, because, you know, even back then, I was the completionist, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You know, you know, I always will be a completionist. I always was a completionist. So, you, you, know my, you know my vibe? You know my drift? You know what's up. But those retro games were not what most of us were looking for, and I feel like they would have made a fantastic completion bonus for something like getting a whole bunch of banana coins or something like that. Maybe that would have made some of those less essential collectibles worth it. But, anyways, you get to 101% and you beat the game. What do you get besides that beautiful number on your screen? You get a cute little scene of Cranky Kong holding quote-unquote auditions for Donkey Kong 64. It's fine. It's silly. I like it. I would say it's not worth it, though. Up until this point, the game found clever ways of repurposing the same animations and sound clips to form new entertaining moments. This bonus scene felt a little too slapped together. As much as I wanted more of the Kongs just being themselves, some of the humor didn't quite land with me. I feel guilty for even saying this because this game gives me so much, but since I'm bringing you the completion perspective, it does warrant criticism. In my journey re-completing Donkey Kong 64, there were 22 hours played, fewer than normally would be thanks to those awesome exploits. Zero deaths, I never even came close to dying, and I never will. 201 golden bananas collected, 200 from all the levels and overworld, and one from photographing all of the fairies. 20 fairies photographed, shot with a camera, not with a gun. 10 battle crowns earned by surviving King K. Rule's battle arenas. They're pretty easy and provide a nice combat center diversion. 40 blueprints recovered from Kasplats. I melted their faces with music and I took their loot. 40 banana medals earned mostly from collecting regular bananas, but some you get from beating challenges in Hideout Helm. 3,200 bananas collected. That's 100 for each Kong in all eight levels. One Nintendo coin for beating the OG Donkey Kong Arcade. One Rareware coin for beating Cranky's high score in the old school jetpack game. 
949 banana coins collected, even though I only needed 150. 13 Fabergé eggs, 500 Pokemon cards, 4 calling birds, 3 French hens, 2 turtle doves, 8,000 stamps. We're collecting everything at this point. You can't stop me. I'm a hoarder and I have a problem. If you're a fan of 3D platformers, play Donkey Kong 64. If you're a fan of Donkey Kong, play Donkey Kong 64. You will have so much fun, and trust me, you won't fall in love with these characters. There's no completion criteria tied to multiplayer, but even that's great for goofing off with the friends for a few rounds. For me, this game falls under the category of a forever jam. I loved it for so long, and I will love it forever. However, I can't in good conscience recommend completing it. All of that backtracking is a young man's game that Modern Gerard isn't down for anymore, even with all the glitches and exploits that I found. And while all those banana coins and medals and whatnot gave this game a Guinness World Record back in the day for the most collectibles in a game, was that a good thing? Maybe things will change in the near future, I don't know. Not only was Donkey Kong 64 the first 3D Donkey Kong game ever, but it was also the last true 3D Donkey Kong game. Maybe we'll get another one soon that will capture the spirit of the franchise without it being such a collective thought of really pointless things. But with that being said, I leave it to you guys. Personally, I think the game is great and it gets way too much hate nowadays, but in the end, completing it, that's a whole other story. So, with that in mind guys, I still get this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It! <laughs>